This is my mid-stakes zoom graph. Isn't it beautiful? About one and a half million hands at almost five big blinds per hundred of EV in win rate. In this video, I'm gonna give you three tips on how I think you can improve your game to achieve a higher win rate. And it doesn't matter whether you play Zoom or not, this is going to apply to all poker formats. All right, let's dive into it. The first tip I'm gonna give in this video on how I think you can improve your win rate to achieve a lot of success, both at Zoom and also regular tables, is to be very solid mentally. This is something that people don't pay enough attention to and most regs are just trying to get better technically but they don't pay attention to how they're performing mentally. And with this I'm talking about stuff like getting tilted because you're running bad, getting overconfident because you're running pretty good, getting into ego wars against other regs, or like forcing aggression, all that kind of stuff that really is going to kill your win rate if you don't pay attention. Now, luckily for me, I've never had to try and improve this. I was always naturally very good mentally. I almost never got tilted. I almost never got into ego wars and you would rarely see me spew at the tables. And I think this is a great advantage that I've had over the years compared to the other regs because I would see constantly other regs getting into ego wars, making stupid plays like really big call downs or really big bluffs in spots where they shouldn't do that but they convinced themselves they should because of some emotional reaction they had towards the game in that situation. So I think if you can be very solid mentally and be very stable with your strategy, never make any huge mistakes, you're gonna be at a huge, huge advantage. Of course, this is much easier said than done. And the way I think you can improve on this is by improving your theoretical understanding of the game. This is something that has helped me over the years to avoid making those really stupid plays because once I knew that what I was about to do was really bad theoretically, that would be enough to refrain myself from taking that intuition or taking that reaction to make that play. So I think if you spend your time improving your theoretical understanding of the game, you're gonna have a better intuition of which plays are really bad and which plays are really good. And then you're going to be able to avoid making those super bad plays. Of course, there are a lot of other tips and tricks that I could give to improve your performance at the tables. I'm not gonna get into this because it's not the point of the video, but you can try stuff like playing shorter sessions, meditating, warming up before the session, all the kind of stuff that you probably already have heard of and that can help you have a stable session or be more present mentally in order to not make mistakes. But this first step is really, really important. Don't neglect the mental part of the game. Don't neglect how you are mentally in terms of performance because this could easily be the reason why you're still not achieving the success you think you could have achieved. Now, let's get into the more important tips here. The third tip is the best one, but the second tip is also extremely, extremely valuable. And this is put pressure in unexpected spots. This is something that I've done over the years and I think quite well and that has allowed me to extract a little bit of edge in spots where most people are not really putting a lot of effort to extract EV. And I'm gonna give you guys a few hand history examples here that I played over this sample that I showed you and hopefully this is going to inspire you to find some of these spots in your own games. Okay, so let's get into it. So I have four hands marked here, all at 500 zoom and you know, there are probably a lot more that I could show you here, but I selected these ones that I think can really highlight what the concept really is about. So I got pocket nines here on the button. I three bet this reg opening from the cutoff. He decides to four bet me and here you have to call with pocket nines in these positions. He goes ahead and fires a quarter pot C bet on the flop. I got nines with the spade, so I think I can float here. I'm not necessarily sure whether it's a pure float or not. I think that without a spade, you should probably mostly fold here. But I call here with the nine of spades, turns a 10, he checks. I go ahead and check. And then the river is the three of spades. He goes ahead and blocks. Now this is a spot where I really think you can call it an expected spot to face aggression because it's a four bet pop, it's a paired board and it's a flush card completing river. So people are not really going to perceive you as being ultra aggressive here, having too many bluffs. So what I decided to do here is attack his small bet and shove all in with the pocket nines. 
and I'm trying to make him fold here I'll hand like pocket jacks or something like a queen jack king queen type hand and I can represent plenty of very strong hands here I can have pocket aces with the spade I can have some slow play 10x on the turn mostly ace 10 I think I would slow play here but also some flushes of course I'm gonna have plenty of flushes here like ace jack of spades ace queen of spades stuff like that queen jack of spades I can jack back on the turn so I can represent plenty of very strong hands here and villain is not going to expect me to have too many bluffs in this spot and he's likely to let go of his bluff catchers let's see a second example I have jack nine of clubs here on UTG I open this red calls from the big blind here comes this 8-5 deuce board. I go ahead and see bet. He calls, turns a six of clubs, like I make a flush drop with the gutter. I go ahead and fire three quarters here, or something like two thirds. He goes ahead and raises here, quite large, a little bit over pot size raise. And with this, with this hand, I don't think it can fold with the flush draw and the gutter. I think naked flush draws are close to indifferent here but a flush draw with the gutter i think i have to call then river comes the six of hearts and I, again he goes ahead and fires here a small bat just like in the example before and this is another situation where his range is full of middling strength hands so he's gonna have hands like four three suited seven four suited nine seven suited here plenty plenty of straights here Certainly he's gonna have a little bit of full houses, like I think six, five he can have in pocket sixes for quads. But in terms of number of combinations, I think he has way more straights than he has full houses here. And not many flushes because he's not gonna check raise a naked heart on the turn. And a lot of his hard combos are blocked by the board. So I think here he's gonna have way too many straights. And this is a situation where if he looks at my range or if he tries to hand read me, it's really unlikely that I can show up here with the bluff, right? I have maybe a few missed draws, like with the few missed clubs with the seven or a nine. But other than that, I'm just gonna have flushes, foo houses, and some over pairs with the heart. So he bats here, I go ahead and jam, and he folds. So this is a spot where I really feel like people are not gonna call enough of their straights, and they're also probably not gonna put enough of their full houses and quads into this small size. So I really like going for the aggression here on the river. We got this, another example, six four suited on the button. I opened for two and a half X. The get three bet's really small here to nine blinds. So I decided to call this one against bigger size you can fold. Flop is four, three, three. He goes ahead and bats a little bit over half pot. I'm gonna call here with a pair, of course. Here's a nine of clubs. I'm gonna check behind. And then he goes ahead and fires again half pot on the river. So you see a pattern in these hands where that option player is mostly using some medium to small size here, which is generally used with middling strength hands and hands that don't really want to face a lot of aggression. So on the top of putting pressure in unexpected spots, we're also targeting some middling strength hands that villains are going to have with these sizing sequences. So he goes ahead and bet this size. And here's a spot where, you know, what bluffs I can have here? Well, perhaps I can use a hand like ace queen off with a club. That's a decent bluff. But other than that, I can show up with a hand like ace five here, six five, pocket twos. I can have a slow plate flush on the turn. So I have a lot of, lot of value combos here and not many natural bluffs. So I go ahead and jam with my six four and he goes ahead and folds. I think he can bet full here, hand like nine, naked 9x, pocket 8s, pocket 7s type hands. He's gonna have plenty of those hands with the size action. Last one, as an example here, I got pocket 10s on the button. This rag opens from the hijack. I threw back here to eight big blinds. He calls. Flop comes ace, king 5, and when I, when I revealed this hand here to, to prepare for the video, I found my size a little bit odd, but later I saw that it's actually a possible size to be used here on this board. Although nowadays I would mostly use very tiny sizing on this double Broadway, especially ace high double Broadway boards. I like to go something like 15% pot with my entire range, but having two sizes here is totally fine on this board. So I go ahead and fire about 60% pot here with my pocket tens. Villain calls. Turns the nine of diamonds. I go ahead and check my pocket tens. And then the river comes 
a queen. So having two tens here is extremely awesome because I block the jack 10 suited combos that he could have. So he fires half pot and I just jam into his face and he folds. Theoretically, this is probably not the greatest bluff actually, now that I think about it, because probably should have some kind of queen blocker here. You wanna block, not only you wanna block the jack 10, of course, that's good, but mostly you wanna block stuff like ace queen here. I think ace queen should be uh, his uh, most obvious bad calls and therefore having a queen. And you could have like, you could have like a queen 10 or queen jack that will both block the ace queen and the jack 10. But anyways, in this hint, I decided to go for it and I don't regret it. He just folded and I want a big pot. So this is what I mean with putting pressure in unexpected spots. Be aggressive in situations that people don't expect you to be full of bluffs or trying too hard to fight for the pot. And therefore, they're mostly going to be playing passively and you're going to be able to capitalize on those tendencies. Now, last and most important tip for increasing your ring rate and perhaps achieving a five big blind per hundred ring rate in Zoom games or any game whatsoever is exploit the recreational players. This is something that I don't know why many regulars, many professionals actually neglect. They don't study enough how to play against recreationals. They spend 99.9% .9 of the time studying GTO strategies or sometimes studying some rag that they admire or even studying another rag that they want to exploit. But like 100% of their time almost is spent studying how to play against other regulars. But in poker, most of your win rate, most of your earnings in your winnings are gonna come from the mistakes that recreational players make. So if you spend a little bit of time studying how to exploit them, you're gonna be able to increase your earnings way more than if you spend time on GTO strategies or how to play against rags. Okay, so figuring out how to exploit recreational players is an extremely, extremely important part of your poker career. Regardless whether you're a cash game player or a tournament player, this is really crucial for maximizing your profits. And in this video, I'm just gonna show you a little bit of a glimpse of what I do to exploit recreational players. I try to exploit them in every single line that I can, in all streets from pre-flop to river, and I'm almost always going to be using a max exploit approach. So a max exploit approach is an approach where I'm just gonna try to figure out what's the highest AV play with my hand and I'm gonna do just that. So just play all situations in a vacuum. And the reason for this is because recreational players, not only they're not paying attention to how you're playing, they're also not gonna be able to exploit you on further instances where you play against them. And it's actually very likely that you're not gonna find them anymore after you play that hand because they play very few hands. So the likelihood that you play against the same recreational player over the long term is really small, especially if you play low to mid stakes. Okay, so I'm just going to take whatever I think is the high CV play with my hand, and I'm gonna do just that. Against recreational players, I really like exploiting the river bets. The river bets, and maybe you're gonna be surprised when I say this, the river bets is almost always severely overbluffed. This is something that contradicts some of what is the common knowledge about poker, about recreational players in the industry. And I remember when I started, people used to tell me that I shouldn't really call down very light against fishes because they don't bluff enough. And that cannot be farther from the truth. If you don't believe me, I hope that after you see these hands, you're gonna have at least some inclination to believe what I'm saying here, okay? So whenever you're playing against recreational players, and I'm gonna give you a few examples here, try to call them really light on the river and trust me, you're gonna capture a lot of EV doing that, okay? So let's jump here into Hold'em Manager again. I'm gonna pull up a few hands that I marked and I marked them under this, under this uh, tag here, which is one specific line I use to exploit recreational players that is really, really fun. I really love exploiting them with this line. And I'm just gonna give you guys this example. Obviously, I exploit them on all lines that I can put my hands on or that I play against them. But I chose this one because it's a really nice one to show you what I mean with their crazy over bluffs. Okay, so this line that I'm gonna show you is a line when you are in a three bet pot out of position, you see bet the flop, and the recreational raises you on the flop. And after they raise you on the flop, you call and then they barrel the next two streets. So they're really putting the aggression there and we're actually not going to give up on the pot. We're going to just call them down with whatever hand we have. And a lot of people might have the intuition that recreational players are not gonna bluff with this line, 
but I've I've been studying population tendencies for the past six years in my life. And if there's one safe line for you to call down against recreationals is this one. Okay, so let's see this first example. I got pocket ace on the small blind here. I three bet the recreational that opened from UTG and he calls. I go ahead and see bet small here on a jack, jack five board. I think that's good, correct strategy here. He goes ahead and clicks me. <laughs> that's really funny. Recreationals do like to click in a variety of spots. So he clicks me here, I'm gonna call, and then I'm already 100% expecting him to fire off the next two bullets, and I'm already decided that I'm not gonna fall on this hand. So I check, he fires half pot, I call. Rivers the deuce of diamonds, a lot of people might be afraid of the diamonds here. I'm not afraid of the diamonds. And the reason I'm not afraid of the diamonds here is because racks don't really have linear ranges. Their ranges contain all sorts of random hands. So when he shoves here, I'm not concerned with flushes. I already know that his range is full of garbage. Okay, so he shoves, I'm gonna call, and he shows up with king, queen of clubs. All right, first one, we got them. Next, we got pocket jacks on the big blind. This is one from 200 zoom. I'm gonna go ahead and three back here. My opponent calls, and there comes an a7-3 board. I'm gonna go ahead and see back here, quite small. And then, this is what they're gonna do. They're gonna click me again. So the guy clicks, and immediately after he clicks, I'm already putting on my mind that I'm going to call down in this spot. Okay, this is like, <laughs> this is one thing leads to the other. When I see a click here, I'm just ready to call down. Turn comes a six. He goes ahead and fires about 40% pot. I call. The river comes the king. Again, a few people might, might be afraid of the king here. I'm not afraid of the king here. I don't care about what card comes. He's gonna shove and I'm gonna call. And what he shows up with, queen 10 offsuit. Now, this is the problem that a lot of regs have when it comes to playing against recreational players. They try to put recreational players on a range, on a reasonable range, on a logical range, but that doesn't work because they're going to show up with hands that they shouldn't have very, very often. So this guy here obviously shouldn't have queen 10 up in the spot, but he does. Imagine what other hands he could show up here that he's not supposed to. He could have a hand like 9-8 offsuit. He could have a hand like jack-9 offsuit. Okay, so don't make the mistake of trying to range recreational players. You're gonna leave a lot of money at the table if you do that. Next example, I got pocket tens here. I limp from UTG. I'm not going to explain why the display on this video. Perhaps on a future video, if you're interested, let me know in the comments if you'd like to know why I play this strategy sometimes. But I limp, the recreation on the buttons uh, raises. I'm going to three back here to play a large pot against him. And flop comes jack five three. I bet small, what does he do? He clicks me. He clicks me, and you guys already know by now what's gonna happen in this hand. I call, turn comes a king, you know, a lot of people might be, oh my god, it's an overcard. I don't care. I don't care that it's an overcard. I'm going to call this guy down, okay? I call, river comes an ace, oh my god. <laughs> river comes an ace, he jams, I don't care, I'm gonna call. He shows up with queen nine of diamonds, and we take down the pot. Now, another hand here, I got pocket sixes on the small blind. Button opens, I three bet, he calls. Flop jack four, four, go for a small quarter pot bet. Villain raises, and you guys already know what's gonna happen. I'm gonna call here, and I'm not going to fold. He bets about half pot on the turn, I call. River's a deuce, he jams, or Close to jams, it leaves 150 behind. I go ahead and call. He's got the king 10 off. Nice. <laughs> we take it. Last one. This one is from Bodog 1K. I three bad small blind. He calls. Flop ace 10 3. I go ahead. Very small C bag. Quarter pot. Villain raises. <laughs> you guys. <laughs> you guys already know it's gonna happen. I call. He bets about half pot again on the turn. Recreationals do love a half pot bet. I call River Nine. He jams. I call. And guess what? He has the solid Queen Seven off. This is why you don't range recreational players, okay? 
This is one KNL and the guy is there hunting Queen's Evan off. So don't make the mistake of trying to put recreational players on the range. Make sure you max and exploit them by clicking the call button on the river. And that easy. All right, this is it for this video. I hope you enjoyed. If you did, please give it a like and also subscribe to the channel. My goal is to bring more and more videos for you guys. So by subscribing, you help me out and you also get lots of new content, okay? This is it, see you in a new video.